Thank you very much uh, for this kind introduction and for those very kind words. I'm all for clamped. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, before I say anything else, I just want to um, acknowledge some people because um, I'm hopeful that everybody here enjoys themselves, uh, but the only reason why we're here is because of a few outstanding individuals, and I want to mention them. Uh, one of them is Charles Brook. The other one is Joe Proudman. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, these two have carried the lion's share of putting all of this together. Uh, I do speak at dozens of national, international meetings every year, but it is super rare to find such high caliber speakers and an audience as diverse as, as it is uh, come together and, and put something like this um, into reality. I'm very, very pleased, thankful to you, uh, to you both, but also of course CDFA, uh, the Dean's, the dean's uh, office as well as Sparked uh, and the Clear Center. Thank you very much. So with that, um, I was asked to talk about beef and here in particular, uh, a topic that's a tricky one. I think everybody here is aware that the dairy methane mitigation as well as methane mitigation from, let's say, feedlots is relatively easy compared to the 800-pound gorilla, which is animals on pasture. But uh, animals on pasture is really where a lion's share of emissions come from. And so this is what I'm going to talk about. I want to acknowledge uh, Sharissa Anderson. Sharissa, where are you? There. Uh, uh, Sharissa is the graduate student who has worked on this uh, project here. Um, we wanted to figure out what is it that the beef industry could potentially do in order to achieve some of the very ambitious goals of achieving 40% reductions. Um, some of those uh, variables here in this modeling exercise um, were developed two years ago or so, and as you know, and as you heard yesterday, some of the knowledge is evolving rapidly, okay? Uh, knowledge around genetics, breeding, vaccines, and so forth, uh, all of that knowledge is uh, developing um, rapidly, and so there's that caveat in here. So we here in California have the most ambitious methane law in the world. It's called SB 1383 and it mandates a 40% reduction of methane to be achieved by the year 2030. So that's really around the corner. And it's difficult to achieve because some of the preconditions to achieving it are not being met. For example, we don't yet have quantification methodologies set for enteric. We don't yet have approved protocols. So let's say by some um, circumstance, we were to have a few enteric emission additives available in a month. We could not make use of them because we don't have quantification methods, we don't have approved protocols. We need to go to work on developing those because otherwise all the technologies, all the research we do will not get us to the desired outcome. So that is one of the reasons why I'm particularly pleased to have this kind of mix of people in one room because it forces people to talk to each other across boundaries, industry, agencies, people in academia and so forth. So 40% is what we are, what we are aiming for. Uh, that is the reduction we're aiming for. What you see on this pie chart here is where the methane in the state comes from. And uh, while we uh, talked about dairy manure and dairy enteric particularly yesterday, uh, there's this non-dairy livestock um, piece of the pie and that's the focus of my talk today. Dairy alone in the state needs to reduce 7.2 uh, million metric tons. We heard yesterday from Dr. Franco that we have made real great progress on achieving um, substantive progress, namely almost 3 million metric tons. So we're almost halfway at achieving the 40% goal on the dairy side. And that is truly remarkable. And one of the reasons why we have quite a few international visitors here, because people from all over the world want to know how does that happen that without force, without rules, regulations, fines, or taxes, farmers in California achieve these reductions? 
how can this voluntary incentive-based approach work? And it does. And that is the recipe for success for all these other places in the world who have ambitious goals too. So the dairy industry is making real progress, I feel. Um, the other livestock sectors need to reduce uh, also uh, 1.8 million metric tons, of which the beef sector um, needs to reduce 1.3. Now, there are differences in opinion as to whether that reduction of 40% only applies to manure or whether it applies to enteric and manure. Uh, and I won't go into that. I just want to point out that there is a difference in opinion in reading the verbiage of SB 1383. For those of you who want to read more about where we have uh, gone uh, on the dairy side, this is a report that two of my colleagues, Ömer Kibriab, Den Samner and I wrote um, and aimed at agencies and the legislature to show uh, the journey on the dairy side. It's called Meeting the Call. Um, but today we'll talk about beef. I talk about beef. There are three main stages of beef production of the beef supply chain. The one is the cow-calf operation. And earlier work that I did together with Dr. Stackhaus Larsen, who is here in the front, say hi, uh, Kim. She's busy. <laughs> uh, when she was a graduate student here, she worked on a paper that was published in the Journal of Animal Science on the carbon footprint of the beef supply chain. And we found that the cow-calf part of the beef supply chain is responsible for almost 80%, 80 percent, 80 of the beef carbon footprint. So many people think it must be the feedlots. No, it's not the feedlots, it's the cow-calf operation. Um, then there are background and stalkers where the animals uh, stay for a couple of months and eventually uh, most of them end up in a feedlot where they reside for four to six months. Um, the stocker and the feedlot uh, portion each make up about 10% of the carbon footprint of beef. Cow-calf is where the music plays. And the question now is, how do you reduce emissions from animals that you get your hand on maybe twice a year? And not every day. How do you do that? And that's tough. So here's some statistics. Um, this is a uh, inventory set of numbers here for total beef cattle in California, 1990 versus 2019. See a slight increase there, the percent change, about 6% more beef cattle. Uh, total beef production, as you can see, has drastically grown. So beef numbers had have grown slightly by 6%, but beef production by 41%. That's amazing. Okay, it has a lot to do with genetics, by the way. Then you have uh, some other important uh, variables here. Direct greenhouse gas emissions have slightly increased, well, slightly by 16%, but that is largely, um, if you look at intensities here, um, offset by the productivity of those animals. But when it comes to agencies, when it comes to what we need to do, um, agencies are more interested in total emission reductions whereas industries oftentimes point out more intensities, which have really drastically improved. Okay? Both of them are important, and both of them need to improve. But I just want to show that uh, we have seen progress on the beef side for sure. This slide here uh, shows on the x-axis the years. On the y-axis, it shows beef production in million kilograms. On the, on the z-axis, the carbon footprint um, uh, per hot carcass weight unit. And what you see there is that beef production in dotted line um, has gone up drastically, as I just alluded to, whereas the direct greenhouse gas intensity is trending down. Interestingly enough, this looks like a mirror image, the one versus the other, right? If you were to want to fold the one over to the other side, they would almost be on top of each other. So, um, we do have a history of stewardship. We have definitely seen very significant advances in productivity and efficiencies. Um, what you see on this slide, on the x-axis, the time or the years, on the y-axis, total direct emissions. On the z-axis, um, total beef cattle in a million head. And the top one, the dotted line, is the animal population. And then you see in gray, is this gray? I don't even, I can't even see it from here, but uh, this large area here, that is enteric methane. 
the reddish sliver is manure methane. And then this, um, whatever that color is, that yellowish, that's manure nitrous oxide. So you can see when you look at beef greenhouse gas emissions, uh, the 800 pound gorilla is enteric. As I said, there is discussion among stakeholders whether or not enteric is part of SB 1383, uh, but uh, for discussion reasons for this presentation here, we have, we have included it. So enteric is the big deal. And here in particular, enteric from grazing animals because they produce way more methane than animals in a feedlot because the, the uh, grazed animals eat a diet much higher in roughage, which is the substrate methanogens and other methane producers see. What this slide shows here is total beef cattle in uh, dotted and then uh, business as usual, greenhouse gas emissions on the Y uh, axis and on the Z axis uh, animal numbers. So this is a uh, total beef inventory and then in green you see business as usual. If we don't do anything, emissions will remain as they have been. Oh. What happened here? Okay. So, if we want to reduce the emissions of the beef sector, then we have to be clear that 77% of that task has to occur with grazing animals. 77%. Animals we don't have daily contact with, that graze someplace in the golden rolling hills of California, put our hands on them twice a year. So, 77%, that's the task. Isn't she beautiful? So, what are our options, okay? And those options are limited. We, we heard yesterday that there might be a vaccine in the future. But let's say somebody were to come up with one, it would still take a long time for it to get, to get approved, to go through FDA approval and so on. It will not be a tool that helps us reach 40% by 2030. Um, there are some other technologies that will also require FDA approval. And so whatever requires FDA approval will not really help us with 2030. So what are options? Feed additives. Yes, there could be an option for part of the supply chain, namely the feedlot part, but not so much under grazing conditions, unless we can get active ingredients into things such as drinking water, and we heard the challenge about that yesterday, or into salt licks, because that's one of those uh, points where those animals um, can actually be accessed. Um, managed grazing and gene uh, genetic selection are those, um, those areas that we felt um, are most likely to be helping us to reach what we want to reach. So if we want to reduce 40% from the beef sector, we need to reduce this amount annually, 0 0.26 million metric tons. Um, the total emission reduction is 1.3. I alluded to that uh, before, and that includes both enteric and manure. So I showed this slide here earlier. Uh, it shows the total uh, beef cattle population and then uh, what SB 1383 requires. Um, as, or in contrast to the business as usual. So the business as usual is the solid line in green that's partly covered by the red line, and uh, the trajectory pointing downward is um, where we need to go if we want to reduce 40%. Okay, so this is the trajectory that we need to engage in, that we need to take, uh, if we, by 2030, want to reduce 40%. So how do we get there? Um, there are three different approaches. Um, this slide intentionally has uh, more text so that you can read it uh, if you're not familiar with those different aspects. Feed additives are one that we talked about yesterday. Um, for purpose of this modeling um, talk here, we have just looked at one additive. That's not us promoting one particular um, producer of feed additives, but that's just because that is the one that's most likely um, available uh, in the nearest future, and that's 3NOP. Um, then we have genetic selection. We heard about this yesterday. On the dairy side, they have looked at methane's correlation to things such as milk, MIR, and they found that there is a genetic correlation, 
and that by selecting for low methane cows, there might be herd wide emission reduction of, any, of anywhere between 20 to 30 percent. That's what I've been told, and I'm not a geneticist. Um, on the beef side, colleagues of mine in the animal science department, now retired, um, have found correlations between residual feed intake and uh, enteric methane. And so we will look here for this exercise into residual feed intake. And then managed grazing. We know that there are certain forms of grazing that have a beneficial impact on emissions. For example, rotational grazing that makes better use of all the forage, that rejuvenates forage, and uh, also increases soil carbon sequestration. So we will now look at these three different approaches, the feed additives, the genetic selection, and the managed grazing. Um, this one here shows those three different approaches and the categories of cattle um, and what kind of reduction of enteric methane uh, one could expect if one were to go with the reference with the literature that was available to us at the time we wrote this paper. Um, so I think it's a little ambitious to assume uh, those reductions for 3NOP. Uh, as, as of now, I think the number that's, uh, that's out there the most is about 30%, but this one here is a little bit more aggressive, okay? So those are some of the um, uh, percent reductions of enteric methane that we are associated with these three approaches. Um, for feed additives, of course, the question is always, do we only use feed additives in the stalker and feedlot environment, or can we, by some means, get these active ingredients into the entire herd. I already mentioned salt licks or something else. How do we get those things into the grazing animals? We don't know yet, but if we were to be able to do it, uh, these are the percent uh, number of animals that we would have to achieve or that we, that we, that we would have to, um, to use in order to make this technology alone uh, reach a 40% reduction of the beef supply chain. So you see the years, you see either stock and feedlot cattle or the entire herd and the related percentages. Um, for genetic selection, you see here the percent uh, implementation for cows and feedlot cattle versus the entire cattle herd. Uh, so that's just uh, using uh, residual feed intake uh, to reduce enteric methane. And for grazing management, meaning rotational grazing uh, for those animals, uh, here are the percent implementations that we would uh, have to achieve for cows and heifers or uh, respectively the entire cattle herd. If we were to combine those three, meaning use all three, then here are the percent implementations for grazing cattle, for feedlot cattle, and for terminal dairy calves that we would have to achieve. Now, considering that we are so limited with what we can do for grazing animals, um, I think it's ambitious to assume that everybody will jump onto the bandwagon and, and do things, but uh, these percentages here of people doing one or the other or a combination of all three, I think they are kind of realistic. That could happen. Altogether, we do find that more and more technologies come online. I encourage particularly those people here who are in R&D with various uh, technologies to think of what can we do for animals on grazing, on grazing lands, um, to equip them with something, whether that's a vaccine or a technology that sticks with them, um, to also work on genetic progress, on, uh, on breeding, um, and I think it will be more difficult for sure to achieve a 40% reduction on the beef side, but uh, I am carefully optimistic that it is possible. So with that, um, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you um, during the meeting. Thank you very much.